welcome to Local Matters. Today we've got uh, an important matter to talk about and we've got a local man to do it. We have with us today Kevin Chambers of Headwater Investments. He's done some micro research over the years and he's bringing to us on a topic that a lot, on a lot of our minds and that's uh, student debt, student loans. So stick around, we're gonna develop that. But Kevin, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. And um, let's give a little bigger picture. You're with Headwater Investments. Yeah. And um, how did that happen? So Headwater Investments was started by my father, Scott Chambers. Uh, he was a finance professor at the college here at Linfield and taught finance there for 20 years. And at one point, he was taken out of the classroom and made CFO of the college and ran their endowment. And so it was kind of the first time he had gotten his hands dirty with the investments. Uh, From the doing theoretical a little, to the practical. Exactly, yep. Uh -huh. so, and how yeah, did it work? It, it, it must went, be all right. Linfield yeah. is doing well. <laughs> it went really well. Um, and then pretty soon after that, people started asking him for advice. And a little bit after that, he uh, realized he could charge people for it and started Headwater. So um, yeah, we've been a company in town for a while now. And you've come along in the last, how long have you been working there? Uh, almost four years now. Um, I went to Mack High, uh, and then I went up to the University of Puget Sound and got my degree in economics, worked for a big pension consultant, and uh, institutional consultant in Seattle, and then um, moved back here about four years ago and have started the process of taking over the business with my uh, business partner, Tom Sherwood. So got some experience out of town, come back yeah. here to share it, wonderful. Exactly. Tell me a little bit about how watching your dad do that transition and starting his own company. When did you think, did that come to you young that say, hey, I want to I want to do that? Or <laughs> were you in Seattle thinking, you know, dad's got it pretty good down there. I'm yeah. going to go do that. When did it happen? Um, so I was living in Seattle working in a cubicle job. Uh -huh. uh, and I got actually an opportunity. My summer job all through college was being a whitewater river guide. Um, so I my old boss kept bugging me to come do river trips with him, so I decided to quit my job in Seattle and go do a summer back on the river after working there for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, and after I was done doing that, I went I went to Alaska, I went to the Grand Canyon, kind of explored the, the West Coast, and then uh, started looking for a job. And my dad said, hey, how about you come try living in McMinnville? You can work for me for six months. You'll get a paycheck while you look for other jobs, and I'm still here. So. It worked out well. Uh, my wife and I fell in love with McMinnville. Um, it was I was always one of those kids who was like, I couldn't wait to get out of town. And then uh -huh. as soon as I came back, I was it felt like home again. So I've stayed. That's a beautiful story. Now I know your dad has a rule about who he hires. <laughs> it's true. It? He I'm the first non Linfield grad he's ever hired. Um, no, but wait I found a, a little he, loophole. Yeah, right. Uh, I went to the Linfield pre K, so I said I was a graduate. <laughs> and, and you graduated from pre K. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You didn't ask for a transcript. No. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad you're here. It's great Thanks. to have you in town. I've gotten to know you through Rotary. We're mm -hmm. both, uh, you're a noon Rotary. Yep. My men's Sunrise Rotary. And, um, yeah, we've been proud to sponsor this Peace Village that yeah. happened out at the, um, the Space Museum. It's and pretty cool. uh, Yeah, I think that's going to be an ongoing thing. And I've just heard some really great things about what happened there. Yeah, I guess we were, I think, the second biggest in the state of Oregon, and this was our first year, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, we got a lot of momentum behind it, so hopefully yeah. it continues. All right. Well, let's talk about your role at uh, Headwater. You have uh, kind of a nice niche, it sounds like to yeah. me. They say, hey, Kevin, go do research. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, you get to find what's interesting to you, what matters to your, your clients yeah. and to the market. So... Um, well, yeah, what everybody wants to know, what are the hot tips? Uh, <laughs> what should I buy this afternoon? I've got my broker on the phone. And, <laughs> well, I don't, know uh, if, I don't know if I can give you too much good advice on that. Uh, we're pretty pretty conservative. We're, we're not kind of investing in individual companies or anything. Um, okay. But one of the things we're looking at right now is um, it, it might not seem like it on and a lot of the things that you read in the paper, you watch on TV, but the U.S. economy is the strongest in the world right now, um, and that's a good thing. Um, if you look at Europe, you look at Japan, they have a lot of problems with their economy. The U.S. is really strong, and that's been true for the last you know, five years. We've seen a huge run up in the stock market. Uh, it's at record highs. And so what we're worried about is what's going to kind of maybe mess with that status flow, the status quo. And uh, the main thing we're looking at is the rise of interest rates. So you might have heard the Federal Reserve has been rising interest rates very, very, very smallly. Um, but what, what, could ha what we're worried about is if, when interest rates start to go up even higher. And that's a good thing for a lot of people. Wouldn't it be great to go to the, to the bank and get 5% on your money instead of zero, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. go down to first fed or whatever and be able to get a return. Um, but right now you're getting nothing. But as those interest rates go up, 
we expect to see a little bit of a drawdown in the stock market. And that's mostly because people haven't been able to get any money, any return anywhere else. So you can't go to, you can't, there is no kind of safe money right now. You have to put it in the stock market if you want to get a return. And as soon as there is more return in bonds and in uh, in the bank, in your bank account, we'll see people take money out of the stock market and put it back in that safe money. Is that kind of the only game in town right now, driving um, the prices artificially up? Is there a price to uh, earnings issue right now? Uh, yeah. So there are, I think a lot of experts do think that the stock market's a little bit over overinflated right now. It's mostly mm -hmm. because of that interest rate uh, phenomenon. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. So I didn't get a tip there. Um, <laughs> uh, Sorry I, about that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you say the economy is strong. Mm -hmm. Watch out for interest rates. Yeah. Um, any concerns? Anything like, uh, be careful here. Well, we're going to talk about some of those things yeah. today about student loans, student debt, yeah, and so. the different kinds of problems you can mm -hmm. get into there. Um, all right, let's go for it. Okay. Yeah, so I think um, student debt's a really important issue right now. If, if you are uh, at home and you, you know, if you have a grandkid or a child who's getting ready to go to college, it's an issue that they should be very aware of, their parents should be very aware of, and it's an issue that's plaguing a lot of people right now who have already graduated and have big student loan. You hear balances. this word crushing debt. Yeah. Don't you hear that a lot? You do. And it just feels like so, uh, you <laughs> never get out from under this. It's going to kill you. So the average the average student graduating uh, today has about $30,000 in debt when they graduate, okay. um, which is a lot, especially if you're just starting off in your career and you already have this big debt burden on you. So there's been a lot of studies that shown that uh, students graduating with big student debt balances are a lot less likely to buy a house. Um, okay. They're a lot less likely to uh, even be able to move very easily because they have this big debt burden and they have these payments they have to make. It's a lot harder for them to kind of move within their life. And start a forward. family? Is exactly. that being yep. postponed, mm -hmm. I guess? Is, is It's being put off. Yeah. It's another, you know, another thing in your budget. When you're making your monthly budget, you have your rent or your mortgage, and you, you know, you have to pay your student debts. And student debts never go away. So it's mm -hmm. not like any other debt, credit card debt, any of those things. Through bankruptcy, you can get rid of them. Student debt never goes away, even oh. if, if through bankruptcy. So they're going to be with you for a while unless you can uh, pay them off. So going into this, uh, yeah. might be people might be thinking, well. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Thirty thousand yeah. bucks. Why do? I, how am I ever going to? I mean, the the problem is, is that what's driving it is the cost of college. So we've seen a huge run up in the cost of college, up two hundred percent or something in the last you know couple decades. And what's driving that? Uh, it's a lot of things. There's you, if you look at. Um, Institutions are adding a lot more amenities, so you know you're seeing a lot more people go to private colleges. That's where you've seen the biggest up, run up. So, mm -hmm. and when you go to private college, you expect to have a nice dining room, you expect to have a nice facilities to work out in, and that type of thing. And those are expensive. Um, and we've just seen a huge increase in the prices. And what's been driving that? It's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. Is also student debt. So people have been able to get a lot of debt, and that allows the the institutions to charge more. Wow. And there's another thing I've heard about um, the high cost of college, and that is that one way to economize is have a higher uh, student-to-teacher ratio. Mm -hmm. But colleges really try to hold back against doing that. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have the freedom to reduce their – to find efficiencies yeah. and reduce their probably their biggest uh, pay, um, item, expensive item, which is the payroll. So they, mm -hmm. they really can't do that. So and that may have something yeah, to do with it. Yeah, interestingly, um, another really big part of their expenses is their campuses. So mm -hmm. if you think about you know normal businesses, they don't have huge campuses. Yeah, if you long. think about even a small college like Linfield, they have a huge, beautiful campus, which yeah. is a great place to go to college. Yes. Uh, I went to Puget Sound. I just graduated uh, with my MBA from Willamette, and we have beautiful campuses, and they're beautiful to walk around. You get to go sit out on the lawn, but that's expensive. Yeah. Um, and maintaining those buildings, uh, maintaining dorm rooms, that type of thing. So where you can get really efficient is actually if you can – if if someone can figure out the online mo model that works. Mm -hmm. uh, there hasn't really been a, a very successful model yet, um, but if we can figure out how to economize the space uh, would also be a really big cost saver in the future. Oh. Um, so maybe trying to I know some institutions are playing with a hybrid model where, you know, for those big, you know, at Oregon State, maybe your intro to biology class has 300 students in it. 
maybe they can instead of having that huge lecture hall, maybe intro to bio could be online or be you know mm -hmm. through a Skype or something, and that could be you know if not having to have a three hundred person lecture hall for every single intro class could save a lot of money as well. Yeah. All right. Well, um, back to so people are facing this opportunity. Yeah. Or they're and they're concerned. So yeah. how do they how do they start into this? Yeah. So maybe we can go to the first slide that I brought. Okay. Um, so these are the different types of student loans we have, um, and most student loans are from the government. So they're subsidized by the government or they're backed by the government. And the subsidies are for people who are low income. So if you don't make a lot, if your parents don't make a lot of money, it's harder for you to afford to go to college so you can get loans at a reduced rate and be able to get a little bit more money. Um, but then also just general public people can also get loans. So, so the government uh, gives offers loans at what kind of interest rates? Uh, right about 4%. Uh, a little bit higher than that. Okay. Um, so pretty reasonable. But if you're um, not low income, you can't get those loans. Uh, you can. You can get. You can get some, but the low income allows you to get a little bit more. And then the Perkins loans are for very low income as well, and those are at about five percent. So the dark bottom, is, the bottom one is federal, uh -huh. and, and the red, and then the orange it's is also federal. Federal, and yep. then the blue is the Perkins. Yep, and that's also a federal loan program. So okay, ninety percent of all loans are from the federal government. A little higher interest rate. Yep. Because you're not low income. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and then, then the, the top section, that 9% up at the top, is uh, is actually private loans. So that's from a bank, uh, from a credit mm -hmm. union. Mm -hmm. And those are a little bit scarier um, because they can charge pretty high interest rates. Um, and usually uh, students can't afford or don't have a credit score. If you're a high schooler, you probably don't have a credit score. Um, so a lot of times parents will actually sign on to those loans as well. And then those loans will follow that parent regardless of what happens to the child afterwards. That's the that's the plus loan. The plus loans that. and the private loans. And yeah. the private loans, mm -hmm. it'll stay with the parent. Yeah. Now, what about the strategy of maybe uh, spread out a uh, little while, uh, spread out the and work mm -hmm. while you're going to school? And it might take longer, but you don't end up with as much a high price debt. Maybe you take advantage of the <clears throat> the lower interest rate debt that you can get. But to a, if you're up against the wall and you you're looking at either high price. Um, high interest rate yeah. or cutting your hours, do you think that's a, a good strategy? Um, it, it, it depends. If you go to the next slide, um, you, so you can see the student loan has gone up pretty significantly here. Um, and That's the big blue line. Yep, exactly. So, um, and others are mortgages. Now we're up over, we're almost to $1.4 trillion. So only mortgages, have, there's more debt. There's more student debt than credit cards, more student debt than auto loans, more student debt than... Uh, home ec lines and of home equity. Loans. Yep. Everybody's got it. Wow. I know. Okay. Um, and if you turn, go to the next slide, you can see that uh, the biggest problem is that we've had a problem with delinquencies. So now, even more than mortgages, um, student loans are the number one type of loan that goes delinquent. Now, these this is the graphics are a little small, probably yeah. for on TV, but so the heavy line is student debt Correct. default. Correct. And you see it jumps up in 2012. And mm -hmm. what happened in 2012? What's so those are the students that are coming out of college right after the recession. And they, there was not a lot of jobs. In 2008, four years, and now you come out, yep. and whoops, you can't pay. Now the other kinds of, um, what are the other lines there? Yep, so the next one down is mortgages. So still, you know, we're looking at about 8% of mortgages. People. So this is people who are behind on their payments by three months. But that's been dropping off. Everything yep. else is somewhat dropping down. Yeah. So after the, the, after the the crisis in 2008, yeah. we saw a pretty big decrease in debt in general from... Uh -huh. Americans, um, yeah. we people got afraid to have debt. Um, a lot of people lost their houses, unfortunately, and uh, a lot of people were a lot less willing to take on debt. We kind of had a run up in debt, and then people learned their lesson. And they except for off. student debt. Except for student that's debt. That's been going. Yep. Okay. So if you go to the next slide, this might be going back to your next question: is mm -hmm. there's a big discrepancy in wages. So going to college still pays. So even though it might it's seem like it. you're taking on this big debt. It's worth it because when you graduate, you get paid a lot more um, on average. So mm -hmm. the average student uh, graduating is going to be making about forty-five thousand dollars a year, and that's compared to you know thirty thousand if you don't. And that includes both going to a two-year institution and graduating from high school. There isn't that much of a difference. So um, let's, let's uh, for the, if the people who can't read the graphics. The yeah. top blue line is the uh, rise of income of college graduates. Right, so and across the generations. 
but that's a long time. That's yep. and, but it hasn't risen that much. So no. you're kind of holding your own. The red lines are non-college graduates. Correct. Their purchasing power is actually going down. Yeah, and that's because and a lot of that has to do with how our economy is shifting, right? So there's a lot less well-paying jobs that you just get a you, all you need is a high school degree. Yeah. Um, it's a lot harder to find you know a wage to support a family without going to college, unfortunately. I want to ask you why, but that's probably a different, different <laughs> show. Um, all so, right. Yeah, in this kind of maybe if you go to the next slide, you can see here, this is the real discrepancy. So this is that, that last uh, bullet point there, and you can really see the difference. So it, it, it's still, even though it might seem like this big burden, out of college, it's still a good idea. If you can figure out in your life to go to college, it'll pay off in the end. Something just jumped out at me yeah. here, Kevin. That is, so we've got the top blue line, the graduates of uh, four-year mm -hmm. college, 45,000. Um, Two-year uh, degrees, uh, average thirty thousand, mm -hmm. and but that's not as uh, high school graduates are getting twenty-eight thousand. The two-year degree doesn't seem to be um, adding much to the annual income. Unfortunately, not. Um, so a again, it's it's going to be very dependent on institution. These are all national averages okay. and regional differences. So here at Chemeca, too. I'm sure we're doing better than that. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'd be interested to look at their data to know. I haven't looked at it, but um, yeah, and it, it depends on the on what you study as well. There's a lot of really good two-year programs that are very determined to get you um, mm -hmm. a good degree. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, there's some that are not that useful. Um, mm -hmm. So for mm -hmm. example, uh, one of the ones that is touted often is uh, leisure and hospitality degrees. You can get a two-year degree in learning how to run a hotel. Yes. And most of the time, that doesn't give you all that much more of an advantage over students who just come out of high school and are go-getters. And can get that same job yeah. without the degree. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so if you go to the next slide, this is just a little bit more. Uh, so this is having a career track job. So you're, this might make a lot of sense if you think about it intuitively, but going to college really puts you um, on, on the track to having a job where you can get promotions. You can kind of um, figure out what you want to do with your life and go up a track. Uh, and, and then it's a lot harder if you don't have a degree. But this is where we might separate a little bit with the two-year degrees. Is yeah. You are more likely to get a job that you're going to be able to work up in. So a career track job. Start at the same salary as a high schooler, mm -hmm. but your mm -hmm. promotion is going to be a Your lot future easier. is better with that yep. two-year degree. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm feeling a little bit better about that. And then unemployment as well. So have it, you're more employable with a two-year degree than a, than just a high school degree. Yeah. Uh, and you're even more employable with a, with a college degree. By 50% here mm -hmm. both times. Okay. All right, cost of yeah. not finishing so, college. So, and this is this is another little uh, graph here that's kind of interesting. The people, and this maybe goes back to the two-year degree, the people who are most likely to default on their student debt are the ones who have the smallest balances. So, the people who are taking out these big student loans, going to four-year degrees, or even going to get their doctorate, yes. uh, become a doctor, or become a lawyer, um, they're don't default very often. Uh -huh. So, only four percent of all defaults. Um, have a balance of over 40,000. You think, oh, the people with these huge $100,000 loan balances, they're probably going to default. But that's not the case. Mm -hmm. It's these people who are going and getting degrees that don't actually give them that much more in the job market. And their so, debt may be five, five, five ten thousand. But that's a pretty big debt if you're not making very much money. If uh, you're, you know, you're working at a, uh, you know, a fast food place or something, yeah. and you're, you're making minimum wage. Then you go to you go to this college that says we're going to give you a degree, you'll be able to get a job, and a lot of times that's not the case, uh, especially uh, you know when we were coming into the recession and that type of thing. There weren't a lot of jobs to get, so people were going getting these student loans. Sometimes going to for-profit colleges, which is probably a whole another discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times those for-profit colleges were pushing their advertising very strongly on these people who would come and take on loans to pay for the entire balance of a $10,000, you know, certificate and it wouldn't really give them anything in the end. So I'm, I hear you cautioning about for-profit colleges. Yeah, and we've seen a pretty big decrease in for-profit colleges. There's some out there that have been doing good work, but in the majority uh, you've seen college for-profit colleges that haven't been successful and they've actually have had a lot of lawsuits and that type of thing from yeah. the federal government, um, especially dealing with their loans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, we're almost getting down with the slides, but this slide just talks about uh, it's important to choose your major when you're going into college. So if you have a, okay. if you have a student that's looking at college, um, it is really important. You know, they might only be 18, 20, but they need to start thinking about what they want to do when they get out of college. So as I mentioned before, you can see in that bottom, that's the bottom 
of the graph there. It says leisure and hospitality, and that's yeah. so. Sixty three percent of people who have majored in leisure and hospitality are working a job where they don't need their degree. I see. So that's you know working at the front desk of a hotel and working up there. Mm -hmm. um, where if you go to engineering or education or healthcare, those are those are places that there's big job demand. Yeah. And there is. Um, you know, you need to have that degree to have that training. And so they have really low levels of unemployment and they're almost all uh, working in a job where they need to use the skills that they've learned in college. You know, Kevin, you, there's a lot of discussion about do you go to school to learn to make money or do you go to school to get educated in that broad sense yeah. of liberal arts? And people come out with degrees and don't do very well on getting yeah. a job and maybe they wonder why or their parents wonder why or yeah. other people wonder why. Um, where, where are you in that discussion? Yeah, so it kind of depends on your situation um, and what school you go to. So there's actually a really interesting article that I found just this week. Uh, it was by 538 uh, Economics, which is a, a website uh, that does a lot of data research. And um, they, did, they, they did a study where they looked at... Uh, liberal arts versus kind of more practical skills. And actually it was interesting, the liberal arts degrees gave you a broader education. And if you just stayed with that liberal arts degree, mm -hmm. you didn't do very well. Yeah. But those students were much more likely to get graduate degrees. Ah. And once they got their graduate degrees, usually in a more specified, you know, specific field, they came out ahead. Uh, they were making even more money than the people who, in, who you know, just maybe did engineering and just stopped at a bachelor's. Okay. So you can still do the liberal arts degree, yeah. get that base knowledge, mm -hmm. but then know that if you want to succeed in the marketplace, it probably means going to get a graduate degree as well. Okay. Good advice. Yeah. Um, graduate degree is usually two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have that broad education, it's yeah, going to take so you longer exactly. to come out with something that you'll also be able to... Uh, yeah. And uh, so this is the last slide here is just talking about, uh, again, talking more about that, the two-year college. So you hear a lot about uh, community college, free community college. And this is, you know, this is go data going back. So we just started doing free community college uh, recently in Oregon. And there's been talk at a federal level, maybe making that policy. However, it, historically, it's not been very successful of students going to a two-year degree and then finishing a four-year degree. Let's, let's, what you're saying is right here on this chart. <clears throat> let's break it down a little yeah. bit. So after six years uh -huh. of following students that have entered a two-year institution, Yep, right? so this is looking at students that started community college in 2010. Okay, 45% are no longer in college. Yep, that means they've dropped out. Six years later. Mm -hmm. And what's the next uh, level? Yep, the red one there is uh, they're still enrolled at that two-year institution. After six years, yep. maybe taking just a few classes, Yep, and they slow. haven't finished a, a two-year degree yet. And what percentage is that? Uh, about 16%. Okay. And, and then 9%, uh, that's what I was talking about at the beginning. Those are the students that have actually gone on from that two-year program and finished a four-year degree. After six years, mm -hmm. only 9% that started a two-year institution have graduated from a four-year institution. Yep. So that's, you know, starting at Chemeketa and then finishing at Oregon State. But this is a national national yep, statistic. Exactly. Again, they're not local. Correct. Um, and <laughs> I'm, then I'm thinking Jamaica does the, the biggest part at the top, that 27% yes. there, uh, that means that they completed their two year degree. 27% um, after six years. And they stopped after two years. So they went to community years. college, got their two years. <laughs> and then the smallest, that 3%, is just means that they uh, started at one community college, went to a different community college, and graduated. Okay. Uh, and that doesn't happen very often. You right. don't see community college transfers that often. Okay, yeah. so those statistics um, are a little eye-opening. Yeah, um, and I, the biggest takeaway for community college or in, in going to college in general is it is a financial decision, and a lot of people don't think of it that way. You know, I remember when I went to go look at colleges, uh, I was looking at what looked cool, or I know a lot of my friends wanted to go to a school that had good sports programs, you know, wanted to go to U of O to support the Ducks. And yeah. it, you really need to think about it as a, as a financial decision because it's something that can affect you for your whole life. So going, there's a lot of resources online um, that you can find to find out you know what you can expect to get in financial aid if that's scholarships or whatever from that institution and there's a lot of things to do a lot of places to look out on the internet to find out exactly what you can afford to pay for college what you can uh, what you should be paying for college you don't want to get overcharged because that happens also sometimes anything else on student debt we no I think about? that's good okay. unless you had any other questions now this um, your research and all this that you've been able to bring forward today is a result of people asking you 
yeah coming to you in your in your work yeah so saying, um i mean a lot of my job is dealing with customers so it's dealing with our clients talking to them about their problems the things that they're worried about and whenever i kind of get two or three people asking me a similar question for example a lot of people worried about student debt uh, yeah. you know we deal with a lot of retired folks and um they come with us because their grandkids are ready to go to college and they don't they don't know what the student debt thing is it's a new thing uh you know when my parents went to college, their tuition cost a thousand dollars or something like that. Yeah. You know, mine was forty thousand dollars a year. So, you know, that's a pretty big difference. You know, just in a generation. So this, yeah. and and again, um, so I just kind of look into things that people have questions about, people think are interesting. Um, try you, to find some different stories, maybe that they haven't heard before. And you've got a blog. Yes, I do. On um, your website. Yep, on our what, website. What's the website? Uh, Headwater-ic.com. Headwater hyphen IC, which stands in for investment consulting. Headwater investment IC. Yep. And there you have a blog where you address the questions that your customers are asking. Yep. So I try to find something. So, for example, uh, one of my more recent blog posts was about PERS, uh, kind of digging into the investment side of PERS. So a lot of times you hear about all these things happening. We just finished our legislative session. PERS was in the news a lot because they were debating PERS a lot. And I kind of looked at exactly what the what the PERS is invested in. Uh, coming so there's from, a, from there's a whole, we talk about PERS shortfall, but there's a yeah. whole lot of money in PERS. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's, it's one invested. of the biggest pension, public pensions, uh, state public pensions in the country. And so you looked into where's that money being invested. Exactly. And, and just, I know we don't have time to dig into yeah. it, but it's a lot of detail. But overall, what did you find on how it's being um, invested? So Oregon is um, over uh, invested in an investment class called alternatives. And that's things like hedge funds, private equity, venture capital. So These those are, are more risky. riskier investments for sure. But, but they can to also make up get that big gap. return. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And what I was mostly focused on, which is something I'm focused on with my clients as well, is cost. Uh, something that people don't realize is happening in the you know, investment world is a lot of times the fees are hidden, so you don't know where they are. You don't know what you're paying. And I look, went into the investments that the PERS is paying and found they are pretty expensive. So they're paying a pretty high premium for these riskier investments. Um, but it could pay off in the long run. The, the last year, they've had pretty good performance, actually. Uh, they've outperformed the average pe public pension. But it could also, if we have a big another turndown in 2008, you know, if we have another one of those crashes, who knows? If they're invested in those riskier assets, it could be a problem. So the fact that these riskier investments uh, cost more to manage, mm -hmm. is, is that because when like I called you on my, I always to call my broker and <laughs> yeah. say, and I was asking you what's hot. Right. That's expensive information because you have to go do a lot of research and figure exactly. out so what the future is. They're hiring people who do that for a living and they charge really high rates. So most of these are, you know, hedge funds in New York City, people who make their living trying to predict what the market's going to be doing. Yeah. And the other strategy is, for example, Nevada uh, pays one guy to invest a portfolio of index funds. And he doesn't try to guess the market. He just tries to uh, buy a diversified portfolio and it's just one guy sitting behind a computer and that's all they pay. Oh, Pretty <laughs> that's impressive. a different model. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I'm curious about this increased uh, cost of fees. Mm -hmm. What percentage is it of perhaps the, you said we performed well, the, uh -huh. it performed well, maybe because we took a little extra risk, we got a little extra money. What percent of, of, the, of that increased return, because we took some risk, mm -hmm. is that extra charge for getting the research on which way to go? So, um I haven't looked at the data specifically on that. Is it um, significant? Is it just, oh, it's just 3% or is it 10 or 20? No, no, no. It's very small. So okay. they outperformed the benchmark by, I think, a couple percent, uh, you know, I think a percentage point. Um, and those are net of fees. So that includes the fees. Okay. Because um, that's mostly in investments. You always want to look at the returns net of fees. Mm -hmm. After you've already paid all the fees, this is our return. Yeah. So they did outperform the last year, um, but it'll be interesting to see what happens going forward. So we're, uh, it's a bit of a risk. Yeah, it we're is. Risking. But um, in, it's a big shortfall. So I don't know if they, uh, they would have to get a pretty big investment <sighs> return to make up the shortfall that we're seeing. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's just a sample of the kind of thing you do yeah. in your research. Well, Kevin, thanks so much for being here. Oh, I was happy. I was I've happy learned a and lot. And, um, hopefully I can come back and we can talk about something else. Definitely. When people ask you questions and you get some good research, call me up and we'll do it again. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, thanks so much.